for those just tuning in, we're going to wait about 30 seconds so people can join the live stream, and then I'll, uh, I'll do intros. And start. But, that sounds good. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> All right, I think we can get started. Yeah. Um, so today, uh, we're here for another edition of Funders Club Live, um, and we're joined by the wonderful Gary Tan. Um, and uh, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. This is super fun. Cool. It's awesome to have you. And um, with us live is a global audience those who haven't been part of the last a couple of these that we've done, this today is the third edition. Um, the whole goal here is really to bring um, the inside world of VC uh, to you and to really make it less of a black box. It's, it's oftentimes something that for entrepreneurs, you, you obviously hear about it, but you don't know much about how some VCs think. Um, there's also sort of on the cutting edge of VC people like Gary who are doing new things, trying and uh, executing it a little bit differently. Um, and, um, and on the other side, as an, a startup investor also, sometimes you know, there's not a lot of information out there about startup investing, and, um, and so really we're just trying to bring that out. And so if you guys have any questions, just remember, ask them. This is like your opportunity um, and to have those answered, and just post in the comments any questions, and our team will, will surface them up, up here today, and I'll, I'll be shifting very quickly into uh, question mode. Um, but before we start, I just wanted to introduce Gary briefly. Um, after uh, graduating from uh, Stanford, computer science yep. degree, uh, spent some time in, in, in industry, I think Sun and, and, and Microsoft for a little bit. Um, actually, was number 10 at Palantir. Uh, was uh, lead engineer, lead designer, um, co-founded what is now known as Palantir Financial um, and some other programs there. Uh, and kind of took some of those experiences, started his own company. Uh, uh, Posterous, and uh, which um, you know had had quite a lot of success, and, and she spun that into becoming actually a partner, partner at Y Combinator, uh, the, the startup accelerator for I believe ten batches or so. Yeah, yes. totally. So, um, in including the batch. That was that, awesome. Uh, this is actually where I met Gary originally um, at Y Combinator, um, and of course today Gary is a partner at Initialized Capital. Um, works with uh, his partner Alexis Sohanian, founder of Reddit. Um, and we're really lucky to have Gary here today with us. So uh, without further ado. Um, Thanks for having me. <laughs> sure. Um, we're going to jump straight into questions. Um, yeah, definitely. Cool. So this question is from Alex and Pedro. So not me, Alex, another Alex. Um, what? I was an avid post Posteris user. What lessons did you learn from your Posteris adventures? In retrospect, would you have done anything different? Oh my God, so many things. Uh, <laughs> yes, big question. Yeah, I mean, so let's see. I mean, we started Posteris not really knowing what it would be. Um, uh, and then I think the most surprising thing about, you know, having now spent a bunch of time on the investing side is that um, the big question like every startup that ends up um, catching some sort of lightning in a bottle, there's like a reason why that thing uh, ended up becoming what it was, right? There's like some reason at that time, at that point in history that like this market and like this idea ended up like, you know, catching lightning in a bottle, that people wanted it and that more and more people wanted it. Um, and for us, and the other hard part about it is like, um, once you catch it, you don't really know why you caught it until many years later. And like, you know, we've seen that for many startups that we've seen through YC and stuff that we've invested in. And then also, like, it definitely applied to Posturus itself. Like, it came out in 2008. Most people would say, uh, why would you be able to start a blog platform in 2008? Like, you probably should have done that, you know, back in 2002 or something like that, right? Um, and in retrospect, it, that was actually kind of the perfect time for that to happen because smartphones were brand new. And not only were smartphones new and photos were new, um, you couldn't get them off the phone very easily. You'd have to connect to the, your desktop and then download it and then sync it and then, you know, log into your blogging software and post it. Or, you know, again, like go through that long workflow with something like Flickr. Um, and for us, 
you know, thankfully every smartphone, every iPhone at the time, you know, apps were pretty new. There were no really great apps yet, but um, you could just click email and email worked. So that was why, that was our reason, like why in 2008 something like that could happen. Um, at, at, and at the time we had no idea. I mean, the other thing was it was the Cambrian area of um, social networks. So Facebook was still like relatively new. It had, you know, fewer than, I, I think like, it certainly had less than 100 million users, right? Well, you know, far less. And then Twitter was brand new. And, you know, it was just also, you know, Jaiku and Blogspot and Can just like so a, many places, a right? On that yeah. Insight. So, like, you mentioned lightning in a bottle, and oftentimes, like, why exactly things were like clicking. Yeah, things grow, but you don't really know why. apparent until later. So yeah. From a, from a founder's point of view, there's lots of founders in the audience today, just, uh, and perhaps learning from posters like that, that example, like, what, um, what can one do then as a founder when, when like evaluating an early idea, given that it sounds like for in your experiences, sometimes it's not apparent as to like why things are clicking. As to how, how actionably can you, can, you, can you deal with that scenario as a founder? Yeah, um, well, at least for us, I mean, we all, you know, used, um, I was using XANGA, Zanga, like a self-hosted yeah. blog, and we just loved blogging a lot. Um, you know, we, we just made a thing for ourselves initially, and sounds, so. It sounds kind of like you had a unique insight <clears throat> based on like some quirky thing, which is you were using like Zanga back in the day. Yeah, exactly. Like and, and, an and we'd seen post by email. Like post by email was something that a lot of people had, uh, but nobody made it like the, the cornerstone of the service. Like you would have to remember like, you know, X Y Z Z Y one two five at you know blogspot.com, and that would be how you'd use it, and you'd never remember it, so then you'd never use it. Um, so we're going to yeah. go back to uh, the second part of the question. Yeah, of course. Um, why did you guys decide to sell? So, so I guess the company was acquired <clears> Yeah. sold to Twitter. And was that a difficult decision? Was that an easy decision? Something in between? Yeah, for sure. I mean, by the time... So I was... Basically, I had uh, become a designer in residence at um, Y Combinator by then. And so, you know, again, like, part of the problem with uh, things that catch lightning in a bottle, like, you don't know why you got it until much later and then sometimes when growth does stop and we've seen this with consumer startups over and over again you kind of don't know why it stopped either and you have this fog of war around well do I keep making new features do I take a step back and just work on uh, the engineering of it right like is there something that's broken about my response times and so you know and again like it took years later like looking back on that experience like that actually turned out to be one of the things that caught that uh, happened, you know, uh, Posturus grew 30 to 50 percent month on month for you know two and a half years, became a top 250 site, that but then it progress. stopped. That's pretty incredible. That, that yeah, I mean, progress. it was really, really great until it stopped, and then we said, uh, in, you know, we were catching up to Tumblr at the time. Tumblr uh, basically was flatlining in user base, and we were growing, you know, throughout that period, and then at some point it flipped the other way again. So Posturus stopped growing and. Tumblr started growing, and um, if you look back on the timeline, Tumblr actually stopped growing because they, they basically went back and rewrote their back end <laughs> and um, made it performant and scalable for a much larger user base, um, and they stopped shipping new features. And for us, the thing that got us there, like, you know, at least what we thought, was always constantly asking customers, what do you want, what do you want, and then just really quickly giving it to them. Um, and that was the exact moment when we should have stopped and said, hey, no more new features. Let's go back and get our server times back so that our best users, the people who write stuff, they need to be back under 200 milliseconds. Um, but it's not something we did. So in retrospect, um, that may have been one of the things. Uh, it feels pretty clear to me that, you know, had we done it a little bit different, we'd be maybe in a different situation, but uh, it's always, you're always fighting the last war on your startup, really. Sure. Yeah. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, if you're not growing, then you need to, you have investors, you have employees, you have, you know, users who you care about, and you need to find the best possible home for them. Um, and that was the right thing for Posturus at the time. Yeah, in that answer, I, I, I am hearing like a recurring theme I've heard other guests talk about, which is sort of as a company grows and scales, there's like different stages of issues and team dynamics and things that come up and let's see if there's another question. Um, so is our mic is our mic now? I'm talking about the tech team behind the camera, but 
my mic's not. Can I be heard on the stream? Okay. Good. Oh yeah. So we'll just be closer <laughs> together. Yeah. So we'll we'll uh, we'll move a little closer. Yeah, that I'll, works. I'll speak a little louder. Sorry, this is uh, a live stream. <laughs> we'll, this is what we're you know good at doing. Is, is we'll do it live. Yeah, we'll do it live. So uh, I will project apologies to to those out there who couldn't hear me. Uh, on to the next question. Um, so what's your <coughs> excuse on me M&A landscape for venture backed startups in the next 12 months? Um, given all the, you know, I think if you're looking at the tech press, there's been a lot of um, attention on some major acquisitions like LinkedIn and Cruise and Dollar Shave Club, Jet.com. Yeah. What do you, what do you think of the M&A landscape for VC back companies? Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously we're viewing it from the seed perspective. So we don't do Series Bs or Cs, but you know, obviously we work with lots of them uh, that are you know out there and. Frankly, I think what happened was 20, 2014, 2015 was a very unusual time uh, for later stage funding. Um, and you know, people probably got out over their skis, so to speak. Right? They, they did deals for companies that uh, had growth, but didn't, they couldn't get back to unit economic profitable. And um, now we're sitting with this list of a few hundred unicorns that um, you know, a good deal of them are very fundamental real businesses that um, will continue to grow, but some of them maybe not. And I think the the later stage funding crowd has, uh, you know, it's a bit of a scare. Like, what's going to happen there? And so I think that's what you're seeing also that it's like kind of an unprecedented time with um, corporations out there having just an insane amount of capital um, just sitting on their balance sheets. Um, you know, do what what can they do with it? They can do share buybacks. It's like. That's you know not R and D. That's not new products. That's n not new services or things that will actually like generate new economic activity. Um, and then you know you so have. Do you think that 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 dynamic with companies sitting a lot of cash will will actually play out to to more M and A? Yeah, I think I think we're going to see a lot more M and A. And then uh, traditionally, you're going to see uh, board members from you know the large growth stage firms being increasingly open to uh, you know early exits because. You know that that's the right thing. Cool. Thanks. So this is a question from Tom. Um, what are some red flags you look for or notice um, when you first meet a founder, startup founder? Yeah, I mean, let's see. If it's co-founders, what's fun? The funniest thing is when uh, they talk over each other, because. <laughs> I mean, as you know, uh, you know, you have a great co-founder relationship, obviously. But you, you know, if you just like put the two of you in a room, it's like you can kind of tell there's a good rapport and like you just like work together well, right? And um, other founders, especially when they're new, they've never worked together before, or maybe they never started a company before, um, you know, or they frankly just don't know each other well. They're like talking over each other. It's like I'll take this question, right? Like literally, like you know, physically, like I'm going to take that one, or you know, sometimes there's like rolling of the eyes and it's like, well, you should, probably shouldn't do that, right? Like people should be, um, in, in order to be great co-founders, you do have to have a very, it's like getting married, right? Like you can probably, you know how there's the study of uh, you, you married couples. You spend more time with your co-founders. Yeah, you'll look more like them over time. Spouse, which is almost kind of <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. At least awake time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, I remember Alexis uh, coming in and speaking to our YC batch and saying exactly that. It's you know, it's marriage, but you know, without the sex. <laughs> okay. um, cool. Actually, just uh, uh, for listeners out there, we happened to. I'm only mentioning this because of the coincidence, but we happened to have published a, a, a guide on co-founder fit. It's at FundersClub.com. I read it. It's blog. good. Gary. Gary's endorsing it, so you should check it out. But it's actually it's built on the lessons of, of ourselves as entrepreneurs, but also like seeing other YC companies, non YC companies, just like go through this this dynamic. So that's that's great. That's yeah, I mean it's the number one thing that uh, destroys companies at YC, and I think broadly too. That um, cool. you, it's really just hard to find people you can really work with. So this is a question from Robert. Uh, <coughs> I have a project I've been working on in my spare time, and I feel positively about the direction of it. How do I know how much money I should raise to get it off the ground? I mean, a lot of it's kind of a personal question too. Like, you know, um, what do you what do you need to get? Sometimes what you can do is work backwards. So, um, you know, it depends on the product. It depends on the market. Uh, it depends on what team you need. Like, is there technical risk? You, do you have to do another nine or 12 months of work on it? 
Um, but you can kind of work backwards from that, really. Like, who do you need to hire? Do you have the co-founding team you need? And then, um, given that, like, how much money do each of you need to actually, you know, some people can save twenty or thirty thousand dollars and live on it. Uh, some people can't, right? Um, some people need to hire two or three more people to actually even bring like a reasonable version of it out to the market. So, uh, I would work backwards from what you think you need to get to. I mean, if you're pre-seed, then you know what what would get you a half a million to million dollar solid seed round, or if this is the seed round, like what would get you that Series A, um, and then kind of make a budget out of that. Um, and then, it, it, you know, so many things are, it depends, but working backwards is usually a good way to do it. Start with where you want to get to and yeah. figure out what you need to get. Right. To and it usually there. is like, get product to market, build the team, and then usually you need some sort of traction number around it's working and here's how we know. As a quick follow-up for that, our, our previous guest, Megan Quinn, had commented she doesn't think that VC money or, or like angel investor money is the best thing for all companies. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's totally true. I mean, there are things that um, could be really, really great businesses, period, that people should work on. And then there are things that um, need hyper growth. And, you know, it's going to be a foot race and five other people are all doing it. And, you know, the, if there's hyper growth and you know, capital is a, a big differentiator, you should raise money. And if not, and you have another way to do it, then you should do it the other way. Uh, question from Charlie. Um, what are the most repetitive parts of your day-to-day? -day, <coughs> of your day -to -day? So the most repetitive parts of your day-to-day. Um, what sort of in-the-weeds type of activities are part of being a, a yeah. partner at a VC firm? Um, I mean, every day is so different. Like, you're meeting, basically, you're generally meeting new people uh, a lot of the time. So... And then part of it is like you, you just don't know uh, what quality of you know person you're going to meet on the other end, and it, it's all just a function of uh, you know who gave the gave the intro, what's the market in. I mean, so that's not in the weeds. Let's see, what is in the weeds? Well, if you have a portfolio of uh, more than a few dozen companies, or I think our portfolio is about 180 companies actually, um, you basically you're going to meet with founders who you've known for years, who you really care about, and it's gonna be either the best day or the worst day of their lives. Um, so if it's in the weeds, like that's the most common sort of background radiation. And like, you just meet people in such, you know, who you care about, who you like have worked with for a long time, who are in like really extreme sort of situations. It's and like then- a roller coaster yeah. of founding a company. Yeah. Either catching them right here or here. Yeah. And the hard part is if you're an empathetic person, it's like that just affects you. And then I go home and it's like, ah, like this was really a hard day. Um, so yeah, that's just part of it, I think. Okay. Question from Blake. Yeah. How do you see the VC landscape changing? Mm. Um, and what are you doing to prepare for that? Or what it, perhaps what have you already done to prepare for that? Yeah. Um, I think the craziest thing that we're seeing, certainly like, you know, especially through YC, is that, um, you know, there are other types of things that can be venture funded and increasingly, you know, biotech, med devices, uh, you know, all sorts of things that frankly have a software component. Like Cruise was a hard tech company in self-driving cars, but uh, it also was deeply a soft, rooted in really, really great software. It's commodity hardware, generally speaking. And then the key differentiator was really, really great software. And so now you're seeing software, you know, you, most VCs out there are very focused on like software-like margins. And it's like, how do you make that model work when now that, you know, the so software really is eating the world. It's eating these low margin businesses and turning them into higher, higher margin businesses. It's taking fragmented um, industries and turning them into, you know, frankly, more winner-take-all markets. And that's new, that's different, and that's, I think VCs are struggling to figure that out, right? Like software is eating the world truly in the way that Mark Andreessen said, right. uh, but it's not happening in the textbook way that you would expect. So almost like the advances of technology, the same thing that happened in software where suddenly the cost came down a hundredfold to start a software right. company. But these things don't look like Microsoft, right? Right, right. It's happening in hardware because actually it's ultimately yeah. still driven by the software that yeah, these things are looking like Uber, which is like you started a taxi company, right. and the tr cl tr classic thing to do as a software startup is, oh, focus on the thing you know, which is sell to you know sell directly to the taxi companies. Let the taxi companies be taxi companies, and yet this model clearly didn't work. Like, tons of people went out, tried to sell to taxi companies. They weren't smart enough. They couldn't actually go to market with it. They you know, and then you you just had to go and 
do the hard thing. You had to be full stack. So, um, so this is a question from. <laughs> I don't Can't know, answer that. I don't one. think you can answer this yes. question. Yes. Basically, uh, somebody was asking what's the next company that. It <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you guys are kind of fun. Sorry. Um, moving on. Next question. What's your vision for the firm, um, and what makes you better than other firms? Um, if a founder happens to have optionality, meaning they're they're like picking their investors, just like how do you how do you think about distinguishing uh, initialized? Yeah, totally. Here's where, I mean, we're going to sound like everyone else. To be totally frank and honest, like everyone says they're founder friendly. You know, many VCs are operators now. Um, and then the reality of it is, like, we're just going to actually try to be your partner. I mean, everyone says that. This is the part that I struggle with. Because it's like, look, like, I was a YC partner. We went through uh, and saw, you know, a ton of companies. And um, a lot of it is, you know, we're going to try to help you avoid the 10,000 landmines that kill companies. And as PG says, like, basically, if you don't die, you will succeed. So that's what we really love to help. I mean, we genuinely love to do this. It's not about the money. It's not about power. It's not about, um, you know, the name or f being famous or anything like that. It's just purely about, like, we live in this freaking crazy place where people from around the world move here to try to make a thing that never happened before. And that's like what we're here to do. Like we want to work with people to help, like bring that to, you know, the crazy huge markets that exist. We, we, you know, I guess like for me, I'm just chasing the dragon on things like Instacart, which you know we shared. And it's that like, you know, you can meet really amazing folks who like look at the world in a different way, build a th like actually build the thing, and then you know it's got thousands of employees or it's you know it's millions of people use this thing, right? Um, and it just happened here, right? And it happened because, uh, and you, you know, you didn't build it. You got to help identify it. You'd help them um, avoid the mistakes. And then, you know, if more of that can happen, then I want like ten thousand of these things to exist, right? And Gary's uh, being very humble. I think that um, I can't name another firm that has yourself, uh, you know, a startup operator, founder, former YC partner experience. Alexis Ohanian, awesome guy. Reddit co-founder, also YC partner, um, and just having lived through all those journeys personally and yeah. having overseen them. So I think you know, definitely that, that deserves to be aired. Yeah. Well. Um, Thanks, man. Yeah, for sure. I guess um, what's funny is I wanted to name the firm um, Daywalker Capital. So it's an obscure reference to Blade, if anyone knows. So Blade is a vampire, but he fights for the humans. What's that? Uh, I mean, <laughs> people said that maybe you shouldn't name the firm after an obscure age, like 90s action movie with Wesley Snipes. <laughs> totally fair. Yeah. All right, so this question's from, uh, interesting. This question's from Dunn. How does sourcing deals through online, uh, online platforms, let's say, um, in, in all manifestations, so there's different types of online platforms, but they're also asking like Funders Club as well. How, yeah. how, does, how does that fit into your approach? Yeah. Um, well, to me, I mean, one of the things I'm really interested about, uh, you know, we've talked about how you've been bringing in various family offices and angels who, you know, they have domain expertise or connections. And then in abstraction, if you look at firms and angel investors broadly, like that's the best thing you can do. Like you're a startup, you need to get your first lighthouse customer. Rolodex. Like how do you do that? Yeah, it's the Rolodex. Like it's literally, you know, sometimes it's 10,000 cold emails, but one warm email will break through all of that. And, and, you know, for these companies, like, one lighthouse customer, if you're B2B, will make or break you. So um, I think that, you know, all things that help founders raise more money, um, and it's, if it's painless, if it helps a lot, you know, if it can help you get your best, cust you know, your first best customer, like, those things are really valuable. So, you know, uh, I think it's a great re evolution of the model. So uh, this question is from Clifford. What advice might you offer an entrepreneur who needs a, uh, a technical co-founder? So yeah, I'm, for I'm sure. Assuming this means a business person who doesn't have the technical skills to, to like launch the company they want to launch. They need somebody. Yeah, technical it's level. a common problem. Normally, what I tell people, I mean, both my friends and people we meet everywhere who are you know have a great idea, have a great market in mind, have domain expertise, and then they're looking for tech co-founders. It's like you know. 
at the end of the day, best co-founders are people you already know, like college roommates, people you knew from, from school, people you grew up with, people you worked with in the past. Like, that's the best place to start. Um, and then beyond that, um, it's always great to kind of be able to code it yourself. Um, the key thing is everyone wants to help a rocket ship that's, you know, they want to latch onto the rocket ship that's blasting off, but nobody wants to be a part of a thing that's going to fail without them, right? And so for a non-technical founder, the number one thing there is, well, maybe you don't need a technical co-founder right off the bat. If you can build the first version, like go to one month, one month rails com, great YC company that like helps people, non-technical people, go like from beginning to end building, I think it's a, you know, Pinterest clone. It's a, yeah, and it's, you know, JavaScript, server-side, database. Um, that's all you need, right? If you can get a first version off and you, you know, hook up Stripe and it's a real payments thing, well, that's really, really magical. And you'll be able to, A, uh, evaluate really good technical talent, B, really attract them, and then C, you know, um, be able to work with them, the, you know, really, really quite well. And so all of that's highly, you know, I'm not saying be the CTO. But I am saying be able to do it so that you can hire and manage and like attract the right person. Great. So this is like uh, going to be one of our last couple of questions that are coming up on. Wow, that was fast. Yeah, move on. It's a good question. Let's do it every week. Yeah, absolutely. I'm down if you're down. Yeah. So we got Charlie asking another question. 180 companies in your portfolio. Wow, that's a lot of companies. How do you handle competitive conflicts um, when evaluating a new opportunity? Yeah, of course. I mean, we've never, I don't think we've invested in a directly, oh, well, it has happened. Um, I think you just have to have uh, a bit of a Chinese wall about things. I mean, you know what um, would be proprietary for a given company. And, you know, look, you know, trust takes years and years to build up, and it takes, you know, one text message to ruin. So um, I think. All VCs have to kind of, I mean, seed investors especially, um, it's a little bit of a gray area. Some funds say absolutely no competitive. Sure. Some say we will maintain the Chinese wall. Um, but with the Chinese wall, like you actually just have to um, maintain it. And so sometimes, um, like Alexis will talk to one company and I'll, I'll talk to the other one. And you know, when in terms of discussing that space, we just won't even discuss it, right? Um, there are ways to do it. Um, it's always tricky. Uh, from Dylan, this question is from Dylan. If you had to start again from scratch with everything that you now know, like what would you do? Yeah. I mean, I think the big one would be I wish I worked on startups way earlier. <laughs> so, um, and I wish that I. Straight out of. Straight yeah, out or of college, or even before that. Yeah, I mean, in college, I mean, I loved programming, and uh, for someone to pay me like a hundred or two hundred dollars an hour to do like contract programming. I, I was like, that's a lot of money, and I'm really happy with that. And then no one, I wish, I would go back and just tell myself, actually, I'd shake myself, like, hey, making a product, you know, when you sell your own time, that you only have the, you know, whatever, work any 80 hours a week you have, right? Um, but if you make a product and that product can sell over and over again, that's zero marginal cost. And that's like so much more powerful. That can touch so many more people. You can make something a lot more valuable if you make products. And that's the one thing that I wish I could, you know, turn the. I would have made products over and over again way earlier. I Go just wouldn't have consulted. Yeah. 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 Cool. Well, uh, the wonderful Gary Tan. Uh, Thanks for having me, guys. It's a pleasure to have you. Great, great questions from the audience as well. Thank you so much. Um, and sorry about the logistical issues with the mic. It's OK. It brought us together, <laughs> closer together. Yeah, very good. Yep. Um, so there's, uh, yeah, making lemons out of, or lemonade out of lemons, yeah. I guess. So. Um, cool. Well, it's great having you. And uh, again, um, hopefully we can have you on again. I think uh, that'd be great. It's great fun. Um, and thank you again to the whole audience for Thanks, guys. tuning in. Um, it was great fun. Bye bye.